Hello, everyone, and welcome to the finale re lecture of Internet History, Technology, and Security. My name is Charles Severance, and, and of course, we've been sharing this virtual learning space called Coursera together for the last eight weeks. And so I figured that I would say uh, one final lecture to kind of sum up the class and where we've been and where we might be going and what we all think about this. So, uh, again, we've been having a great time, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm turning in the final grades. It feels just like a regular class to me. Uh, right now, the fall semester has started, and I'm teaching two on-campus classes here at the University of Michigan, and, and this Coursera class feels like just another class that I'm teaching, and it feels really great. Um, of course, the place that we are is a virtual place, but in actuality, real places matter as well. So I just wanted to do something I didn't do in the beginning lecture, and that's give you a sense of where I'm at um, and sort of where this comes from. Uh, of course, it's coming from the University of Michigan, and I am so fortunate to live in the most beautiful building, the most beautiful campus building built in the last hundred years, uh, called the North Quad at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, if you ever get a chance, come. If you're in Ann Arbor, walk through the building, take a look at our classrooms. Just absolutely gorgeous. 2455 North Quad is kind of the, the showcase classroom. I'm, I'm just blessed to be able to teach in such a beautiful classroom, and it's filled with somewhere between 40 and 80 students when I teach all of my classes. And so, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And, uh, and I want to uh, sort of show you uh, where you fit into this whole picture. So let me go grab this other camera here. Um, so here we go. Um, here you are. Uh, this is my office, and this is where I teach from. Uh, there's, here's my office. Hi there, Sakaiger. There's my Sakaiger. There's my Flying Harry Potter from my SI-124 class. So this is my class, and I uh, do my lectures here. Um, see, I got a little light to give me you know, to make me look more human. Um, I do my scribbling on this uh, Cintiq 12-inch <coughs> uh, sort of combination pad slash display. I still have my regular laptop back there, and there you are. All right. I, got the, I don't like to see myself on camera. So there you are, and I look at you right through this little camera, and, and there you are on my HD camera. And, and so here you are, and sort of welcome into my office, and uh, there's a whole bunch of wires that uh, makes this whole thing possible. So now I'll, I'll go put this camera back, and, uh, and come back and talk to you. Let me flip that. Boop. There we go. Okay, so all good college campuses need a nickname for every building. The name of this building, nickname, is called Quadwarts. And that's because I claim it was built based on someone who really was a big fan of Harry Potter. Like this is our cafeteria, and you can sort of see all the houses on their four tables, and you can see the snowy owls come flying back and forth to deliver the mail, and the chandeliers, I mean, you know, this is just like a total rip-off of Harry Potter. And, uh, and of course, it's lovely. It's beautiful and it's fun and students think it's really great. Um, it's a really, really fun place to be. And, uh, and of course, given that it's uh, uh, imitation Hogwarts, we have to have a sorting hat and a ceremony. And uh, I like to do have fun in my uh, first class of fall semester with incoming students and uh, do a sorting game. A couple of years ago, um, I was you know, talking about quad warts and Hogwarts, and the students in the class said that I couldn't be in Gryffindor, right? That I absolutely couldn't be in Gryffindor because of my name, right? Charles Severance, Severus Snape, so I have to be in Slytherin. But I've resigned myself to being in Slytherin. Um, the beautiful thing about Slytherin is that um, Slytherin, Gryffindor is the, always wins, but Slytherin's the enemy. The other two, whatever they are, they never really get much story time. It's, uh, it's Slyther Slytherin and Gryffindor that really kind of cause the story. And in particular, Severus Snape is like a combination good guy, bad guy. He sort of seems to be a bad guy, but then turns out to be a good guy in the end. And that's sort of like, I like that. So, I am here and I am representing for my Slytherin clan. This is a official Slytherin tie. This is a Slytherin coffee cup, or tea cup in this case. And this is my wand, an official Severus Snape wand. 
Now it doesn't draw on my little drawing thing, but I could, if I have to, when something goes wrong, make time go backwards and uh, let me go back and fix mistakes in my lectures. So, welcome to quad words. Let's talk a little bit about numbers, just the numbers off the top. Now, another feature of the University of Michigan, the second most awesome feature of the University of Michigan is our football stadium, which is one of the largest, it's the largest football stadium in the world, um, for those of you American football stadiums. Yeah, the 109,901, and it's like, I think, the third largest stadium of any kind in the world. And if you look and you say, oh, wow, how many students signed up for Internet history? This is the size of a small town when it's full of people. And if you look, about half, about half signed up for our course. Really the size of a small city signed up for the course. Now, that's just kind of a PR number. The real number that I think is important is the number that made it through the first week and took the first quiz. A lot of people just are curious because of the hype, and that's fine. So 11,640, and so that's really about 10% of that stadium. I made it through the first class. Um, the number of students with certificates is about half that. So here's the number of students that made certificates, one sort of slice of our stadium. Just to compare that to the number of undergraduate degrees we give in, the, in a year is about 6,600. And, uh, and the number of students that I will interact with in one of my fall classes sitting in this room right here is 152. So that's, uh, that's quite a jump, 20, 300, uh, 30 times more time. It would take 30 classes, I think, if my multiplication is correct, 30 classes to get to the point where I've interacted with as many of you as I have. Um, and it's, it's absolutely been lovely. So uh, at about the two-thirds point, I did a survey of you all. It was voluntary and 4701, which means about two-thirds of you answered it voluntarily. We had about 6,000, maybe 7,000 active in the class at the time. And we can see things like, you know, the online class. It's the first online class for about half of people. And it's the first large online class for about two-thirds of the people. Um, you, you, you've heard me talk about the fact that I care a lot about teachers and I think the Coursera has a wonderful ability <clears throat> to teach teachers or give teachers material that they can use in their class and enhance everyone's class, not just by taking my class, but by taking my ideas and bringing them into your class. And so I really care a lot about you know, how many teachers and how many teachers are thinking about using the materials and, and so that's exciting. And so <clears throat> I really want people to use these videos and borrow my slides and my slides are Creative Commons and you can do whatever you like. Um, it would be better if we had a, a more balanced male to female ratio uh, that, that I hope will, will improve in time. Uh, the age group I think is, is a pretty pretty predictable. Um, it's certainly the largest group of people are kind of the people outside their, you know, finished with their education, kind of supports the professional development motivation or personal growth and personal improvement. Um, it's exciting to see uh, young people sort of in their early college or just post high school uh, to be part of part of our learning community and you know for us older folks I think this really for me particularly as an engineer and trained engineer my whole life I really enjoyed taking for example watching Eric Rabkin's class because back when I went to college a literature class was something that I would either avoid or get through as with as minimal energy as possible because I loved what I was learning but it has allowed me to go back and like really kind of re reflect on the kinds of things that I really did not value when I was 19 and 20 years old and so I I think that there's all kinds of wonderful potential for personal growth and expansion for uh, folks folks with little gray hair so I think that's really exciting I like I like how that age um, worked out so if we look at um, the kind of education, it sort of correlates. Um, if we go to the people that are in high school or just graduated from high school, that's this group of people. If we sort of, uh, college in general is about, about half, with about two thirds uh, having or working on a four year degree, uh, have a four year degree. And then we have a good chunk, uh, quite a bit, about a third, uh, is uh, post graduate folks with either a master's degree or a doctoral degree and and so uh, you know how many how many people in here are some of those teachers maybe some of these people are the ones that are doing the teaching and and, uh, and so but again a, a nice a nice diverse crowd of folks and uh, and with representation reasonable representation from uh, all kinds of folks 
Um, this is one of my favorite things. I worked about three days on putting this data together. Uh, this was your self-reported answer to the question, what school are you going to or have you gone to? And you see it's absolutely lovely in how diverse it is. Um, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, uh, Australia, India, strong India, uh, all over the world really um, is where, where you all went to school. Um, the next graph is somewhat different. We asked you by, to report by state uh, where you were uh, taking the class from. And so I, the, it, it spreads out a bit, I think. It, it, it goes even further, I think, than uh, where you went to school, although it does, does highly follow, as you would expect. People tend to stay where they went to school, but um, there was a little diversity. I think the fun thing here is to zoom in and find yourself or find your friends. There is no personal information in this. Um, I took all your data and ran it through a geo mapping, uh, geo mapping API that Google has, and none of the data that's in here is the data you entered. It's the data that came back from Google. So if you said something silly like "I live on a boat," and it decided that this, oh, <laughs> it decided that you know, boat was right there, then it's there. I didn't, I didn't try to look at your responses. I just submitted them to the uh, the geo coding API that Google has. I mean, it was kind of fun to do. But uh, and so there's no there's no personal data in here, so don't worry about that. It's just you know, it's just a, a roll up of what's going on. Now I think this data right here is the meat of the course. Um, as as I said at the beginning, you know we started with almost 14,000 students watching that first week's lecture and almost 12,000 students taking that first week quiz. That to me is the kind of notion of I, these are the people that really registered for the class. It's the ones that at least showed up for one lecture, at least made it through the first week. And so, um, and so that to me is the beginning of the class, the beginning number to look at retention. And this, of course, is a graph of retention uh, versus time. The bottom line here is time. The bottom axis is the weeks. We did seven weeks of uh, lecture and uh, content, and we did one week of final exam. And so uh, the first and most obvious thing you see here is that was the, uh, the second week was the, what I consider like the worst disaster in the course when I tried to do a writing assignment too early. And I think I really didn't understand um, the impact of a writing assignment on non-English speakers, especially when I wasn't so organized about my rubrics. Um, but I, I, I had to ask myself as there was sort of kind of problems with that. I was like, is, is it my goal to teach writing in this class or is it my goal to teach the internet? And is this a beginning class or is this an advanced class? And I just decided that writing was not part of it, not a critical part of it. And so I sort of promised and I said, okay, Everyone kind of gets their 10 points, no matter what on that one. I will chalk that up to my mistake. Um, and so the interesting thing is, is I, I do think that, that, that if I had forced this to be a writing class, I would have seen uh, uh, quite a drop off if every, every assignment is writing. Again, this is not a writing class. This is not supposed to be about writing. But I think because I recovered quickly, I think that you can kind of see that this line really just kept on going. And people accepted the fact that they were going to get full credit and were willing to keep trying on the course. And the rest of the class was, uh, the rest of the course was done with, uh, with uh, quizzes. So these are all the quizzes, basically. Now, what I also learned from this experiment was that there was a group of people in the class that just, just wanted to dig into it so deep and interact and do research outside of class and 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 I didn't want to keep those people away from each other because there was a subset I didn't know how many well I think we know how many now because I created these extra credit assignments and so this is like 700 and this is like 650 two extra credit writing assignments and I think these went really well in my reading of them I just thought that people worked very hard it wasn't just English speakers non-English speakers worked very hard everyone kind of knew it's extra credit so so expect to work hard in the writing so the next time I do this class I will probably have at least three extra credit writing um, I, I kind of got the idea from the HCI class that he had two sort of tracks now I did not want to have two tracks in this class because I did not want to say that this was a writing class. In the HCI class, there was the studio track and sort of like the quiz track. And that makes sense. This course was about learning the material. And the quizzes did a fine job of capturing that. And so I think this was just a fun extra thing to make it more enjoyable for those people who really wanted to dig in. And so it wasn't so much extra credit. And I think what I will do in the future is I will make it so that 
Um, if you really ace the extra credit, then you walk into the final with very high confidence that you're not going to have to worry. Some people even start skipping the final. So you can think of the writing as potentially a substitute for the final in the ultimate pedagogy of the course. If you really, but then once you choose to do the writing assignment, don't complain about the writing assignment. Don't complain about the harshness of peer grading. Just accept your grade and get better and use it as a learning experience. Both the people doing the writing and the people doing grading have got to commit to making it a learning experience. And it's not perfect and we're not going to regrade it, etc. So I think that worked really well after I sort of quickly recovered from my mistake. Um, and then we get to sort of like the quiz, the, lab, the, the people that took the final were are really kind of follow right on along the quiz line. Um, uh, 5,400 took the final and f just under 5,000 got the certificate. And so that's kind of where the certificate and the final work. And so I think it's really good. I'm looking forward to the next time I teach it, sort of watching these curves and watching how that ec another extra credit works and then changing this quiz and seeing if we can flatten that, maybe I could flatten that retention out a little bit more like that. Um, that'd be nice if I could accomplish that next time. So, so that's that data. Um, so let me explain, I, I had kind of a plan for the course that I didn't completely, well I sort of did share with you in the welcome lecture. So I, it wasn't just to teach you material. I, for me this is a, a, a bold experiment and and so my goals for the course first were to be in an introductory course. Uh, I saw many courses on Coursera that were like junior level college classes or senior level college classes. And, and that's great, but I think that if we're really going to teach the world, we have to teach people how to learn in this environment. And just like when you come to college your first year, some of the classes you take are really kind of socialization and normalization of skills, writing, uh, uh, catching up for people who have different backgrounds, debugging technology. And so I wanted to have a relatively low stakes prerequisite style course where, you know, I'd like the later courses to be comfortable telling people, you know, you're not behaving. You're not behaving. Um, but I also am uncomfortable saying from the very first course, just jumping all over people about their behavior. They, we have to teach people how to behave in these environments, how to use the software. Wow. The software is complex and it's rich and and we have to learn and if if a class takes off at 100 miles an hour from the very first day and some classes that are junior classes or senior classes or advanced classes are going to do that but you're going to have to learn how to use the software it you're going to have to learn how to write you are and all these courses are not going to let you get away with no writing so you've got to come up with a class that can give people a softer introduction to writing so in my class i wanted it to be that if you were a non-English speaker, you could try to write. And we as English speakers could try to learn to grade, and we could grade people who were not speaking the same language that us. So I, I think that that's all how to write and communicate to each other in a non-threatening situation so people don't decide, I can't do it. That's what I don't want to see, is I don't want people to go like, oh, this is too hard. And then it becomes a filter. I mean, if we want to teach everybody, we got to teach everybody regardless. We can't just say, oh, you know, we taught a lot of people. Well, how many didn't you teach? Right? And so I wanted this course to be about teaching as many as possible and not saying you're not good enough because whatever, because your internet connection wasn't fast enough or because you don't have, you're not good enough in English. To me, I did not want that to happen. Technical issues. And this just whole learning community is just a skill. And I think we're going to find that people who've taken two and three Coursera courses are just going to rock so much at helping each other learn because that's really a critical part of what it is that we're doing. The other thing that I wanted to do was, I, you know, I told you at the beginning that one of the things that I've done is I was the chief architect of the Sakai project and I, and I had to build an open source community from sort of nothing. Um, we could write software, but at some point I knew that for that software to sustain that it had to be an open source community. And so I've learned a lot about how to create a community of people who just kind of randomly come together. And the concept that's really common in open source is the notion of the benevolent dictator. Underlining both words. Benevolent, meaning calm, nice, friendly. Dictator, meaning makes decisions when necessary. So you have to have some rules, right? So I deleted some forums. I did that and I said, 
sorry. And then like everyone's like, justify that. It's like, nah, I'm not going to justify it. It just crossed a line. We're not going to worry about it. It wasn't on topic. It was People were being mean to each other. And no, I didn't delete one post at a time. It's like, let's just get off of this. So at some point, somebody just make, needs to make a decision, clean it up. Coursera staff did the same thing. But that choice has got to be done in a way that it's not a mean person. It's like, I'm a dictator. No, I'm not a dictator. I'm a benevolent dictator. I, I have the best interest of everybody at heart. And yet, decisions can get made. And so that there always was a way to kind of keep appealing and keep appealing, and then if someone's going to make a decision. Now, you might not be happy with the decision, but someone would make a decision so we can move forward. So there's got to be real enforceable rules. And the people in power, that means me and the Coursera staff, we can't like hide behind our power and go like, oh, we're the great and mighty gods, you bow before me. It's actually the opposite. The people in, in power in these community situations have got to uh, share their power and then promote the people from within the community. And so you need to make it so you reward valued behaviors. It, so I would much rather answer a question, than for, if there's a question in the forum, I would much rather some other student walked in and answered that question first. And then I walked in with a little tiny thing that says, yep, exactly right, Jan. Right. So my job is not so much to answer the question, but to reward the people who do the things the right way I want and amplify the good behavior. Make good behavior infectious, punish bad behavior, I don't mean by mean, but just kind of like gently dissuade people from bad behavior with gentle processes, but also gently encourage. So both the positive and negative, and that works really well. Now the other thing that you learn uh, in open source is that you got to let go sometimes. You can't just, you know, I, you know, I, when we did Sakai, I was two years ahead of most of the people that were joining, but I had to realize that the people joining were going to be smarter than me eventually. And so um, I did this from the very beginning in the course, right? Um, Jeff Stern uh, started this blog post, uh, this discussion post, and he was going to like make a resource list. So I just made an editable wiki, right? I made a wiki and I let the students edit it and I pasted Jeff's stuff in. And then you'll notice I thank Jeff, right? I, I celebrate the behavior that I want to see and empower others to take that kind of behavior, to take control of the class and do it, um, do it with my blessing, right? Take control of the class, improve the class, adjust the class. I'm listening and I will be supportive. Another example, and this is the thing that I think saved the class, honestly, was because um, I was feeling really bad about the fact and and this was a discussion that was led by a woman named Sue Lin. And basically it was a discussion about how bad my rubric was on assignment two. And again, you gotta accept criticism. I gotta and I gotta be gracious about that and I gotta listen. And then I gotta prove that I listen by actually changing. And so Sue Lin starts brainstorming and then other students come in and it, if you go down on this, if you go down later on this, you'll see that the rubric that I used from that point forward and likely will use from now on. I even wrote a blog post about it because I think it's such a lovely rubric for a generic writing assignment. There's rubrics for things like check to see if they mention the Civil War. That's fine. But this was a rubric about general writing, like was it interesting, was it relevant, did it cite its sources, and, and, and it wasn't just Sue Lin. What happened was that Sue Lin started it and then others would comment and then she would go back and edit it. And this is a perfect example of a learning community taking charge of its own learning and 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 my job in that situation is to empower those people to make sure that they know that when they do something I will in integrate it into the course right it's not like I just let them go by themselves and make up a rubric at some point I had to pick the rubric and I had to choose the rubric and I said this is the rubric because there were still people that would argue about the rubric most didn't but a few would so that's where the dictator part comes in, where sooner or later, it's like, this is great, it's great, it's great, it's great. I'm going to thank you, Su Lin, and your, your 20 compatriots. Now I'm going to take it. It's my rubric. It is the course's rubric. And let's stop debating. Let's move on to some other topic. And so that's, that's the balance between the power of the me in the course and the power of the rest of the class, which I really liked. Of course, another thing that I absolutely loved was office hours. Now you may think that the purpose of the office hours was so you could meet me, but it wasn't. Um, they talk about loneliness in distance education and we faculty are lonely too, right? Uh, it's not just you students that feel somehow disconnected and alone. And so I use these office hours as my way of 
seeing faces. I could not see 11,000 people. I could not fly the whole country. And I didn't want to do it in, I don't know, some people, I guess, do a Google Hangout. I find those dull as paste when I watch them. So I wanted to see some people alive, and I wanted to ask them questions. And if those of you who went to office hours, you saw what happened. What really happened was it usually lasted about two hours, and it was mostly me listening and saying, how would you change this? How would you change that? So it became like a focus group for me, but it really was very, very fun for me. I'm traveling. I don't know if anyone is interested in ever meeting with me again, but uh, I'll, I'll, through our Facebook group, I'll let people know where I'm at, and I'm going to be in Spain and Korea and Amsterdam in the next couple of months. So maybe I'll just keep running into you, and when I run into you, I will thank you, and I will ask you for your feedback on how to make the course better. So, things that I thought made the course work well. I thought Twitter worked really well. I told people, don't send me email, send me Twitter, and it would pop up on my cell phone, wherever my cell phone is, anywhere on the planet, and it does, and it was great, and people were very respectful of that. Um, I can't thank the people enough who were the first people that as soon as I put up a quiz, within two to three hours, they would take the quiz, and they'd be like, oh, Chuck, question 23 is, uh, yet again, not quite right. You, uh, you don't know the difference between affect and affect, effect, or apparently I still don't know the difference between those two things. So Twitter was great because it was instant, but and people respected it perfectly. No one sort of wasted any time. Every once in a while people would send good wishes, but most of the time it was like, Chuck, you need to fix this. Chuck, there's this thread, this thread is falling apart. People are beating each other up. Go in and fix it, right? And it was sort of my students in the class that were doing a lot of the, the patrolling of what was going on, and then they would bring my attention to stuff. People thought that somehow I would have instant access, and the answer is no. What I did is I, I listened to Twitter, and when Twitter told me to go look at something, I was in there. And so it seemed like I knew what was going on, but really in my eyes and ears were all the rest of the students, and that was just wonderful. I love the discussion tool in Coursera. Just the voting, it just it's simple and it's effective. And, and the multi-take questions with auto-morphing questions, I, I didn't realize how awesome that was until like about the third quiz and then I really started enjoying. It's like I finally got what it meant to turn a quiz into a learning activity rather than a measuring activity. Um, and that's when you all of a sudden started seeing me put lots of explanation in the quizzes and, and all these clever things to make you take the quiz again and then teach you something else the next time you took it. Um, I like this lecture format. I like me and the Cintiq. I write on my Cintiq over here, and when I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at the Cintiq. I think that works really well to have both a face on the screen and this. Uh, I think it would be a mistake if I just looked at you and talked like this all the time. Um, this is more like how I do in a lecture. I, I look at students sometimes. I look at my screen sometimes. Sometimes I walk around looking like this because I'm confused. Um, uh, discussion forums and the voting, that worked really well. I do wish we could have a way to say no negative votes on this forum for things like the Student Hall of Fame. Um, you guys just get a little too excited with your negative votes sometime. Um, amazing, amazing! I just, the cognitive load of the forums, I still don't understand. I'm trying to figure out why it works so well. But I literally spent no more than three to four hours looking at the forums. But I got email automated from the forums that called my attention to things. And I just, it seems magical. I, I couldn't figure out how it could be so on target about sending me stuff and not just delusion new stuff. Um, you know, I things got a lot better when I started signing the mail personally rather than saying from the staff. I think people uh, don't like hearing from robots, basically, and Coursera staff are wonderful, but I think signing things the Coursera staff, that's fine if it is truly the staff, but uh, things coming from me needed to come from me. Um, and of course the office hours. Oh, wonderful. So, things I would do differently. The welcome lecture, I, I taped that before I had any freaking clue as to what was going on. So, there we go. I gotta fix that next time. It'll be a lot better. I think I need a lecture on how to use Coursera. I actually think that Coursera should have a couple of these things that we could just make available. Um, I'd like to see them, like where that resources button is. A lot of people got confused by the resources button. The flag icon. I heard people learning about the flag icon. I think the flag icon is really, really important because that brings the staff to an issue and it, it can get people kicked out of the class if they just r insist on doing um, um, disrespectful things for each other. Late days. I, I don't know. i got to figure those out. I, I still don't fully understand how late days work. 
I'm not surprised that students didn't figure it out. So there's some combination of the points off plus the late days plus the delay. And whether or not this, if it's two days ago, do I need two late days? Or do I need three late days? <laughs> Somehow we got to figure that out. It might require some software changes. Um, community communications guidelines, I think I'll make up front that you know, I'm going to delete a thread. Coursera staff are going to delete a thread. I don't want to do that all the time, but I want to make it clear that that when it happens, people don't sort of get all freedom of speechy thing. And I will delete threads more often. Um, now, maybe the Coursera staff was doing it behind my, be, um, without my knowledge, which was great because uh, some policing needs to happen and people need to just kind of be calmed down. And when a discussion just goes off into the weeds totally, it's like, why? Are we, I wish there was a way to uh, release the lectures early to get them translated early. I felt that um, people who were non-English speakers were sort of a, a week or a week and a half behind sometimes and that really bothered me using their late days because I wish there was a way that I could... I don't want to release the lectures all at the same time because I think that's cognitive overload. I think frankly if you saw the week seven lecture in week one you all would have dropped the class. But you all did fine by the time we got you there. So I do not like giving you all the lectures at the same time because it'll scare you. Right? Some of you just want to go see the whole thing, and that's fine. I do think I'd like to come up with a self-paced version of it, but for the kind of people that I want to teach in this class, I don't want to reveal the whole thing. But I do want to reveal the lectures early enough so that the, like, the sharp students, the ones that are like taking the quizzes in the first hour, could get there and start translating them. That's got to be good. All right, extra credits, because all writing classes, extra credit, absolutely. That'll be how I do it next time. Um, I don't... I haven't figured out how reputation points work. I think they're really valuable. I, I wish I could have used them in grading. Uh, just, I like the student editable spaces, although I've heard from other faculty that um, it doesn't work so well. Um, it's uh, part, maybe it's, I had to get them started somehow. There's so many natural leaders in these classes, and we, as the faculty, are so. In, and when we got six thousand students or ten thousand students, so we just can't do it in the, in the student leadership and the learner leadership and the self self policing community is so valuable. I wish there was a way that I could sort of promote people and give them ways to communicate with the class that are just so that so they don't have to just wait until their really good ideas are voted up in the forum. As an instructor, I can post something in the forum. I can pin things, I can do things, I can delete things, I can move things down. And I think that there are people in the learning community that need that power as well. I, I'm going to re-record the lectures because I didn't exactly know what was going to be one week, one week, two week, three. So I have these recorders, lectures that go right up. I split end of week one is like in between two words and i got to fix that. Um, there was a lot of complaints about the fact that I would be going like during a quiz question. And um, we, I, I talked with Kate and others about that. And I think the thing to do is I, I just am a motor mouth. And I just have to every once in a while pause in case I want to put a question there. Just like that. And so it's a, if I allow a breath once in a while, then then it'll be okay. And I don't have to motor mouth the whole time. I'm so talkative and I just keep drinking all this tea. And it doesn't have caffeine, but it makes me talk faster anyways. I really want to come up with an extensive preview so that people don't register just to peek. I would have rather just had 12,000 people registered for the class and then sort of that was the beginning. And I think a lot of people registered just to see what was going on. And so it's like, hey, I'll show you what's going on. Um, I, there's a lot of debate about, you know, this should be a self-paced class. Fine. But it wasn't a self-paced class. And then people were complaining after sort of week three and four, like, how come I can't go back and do all this stuff? And I used up all my late days and I still, and it's like, this class as structured was a timed class and we were to be together and I wanted everybody to be together. I'd like to come up with a self-paced class eventually. I would. I'm, I think about it differently. I think maybe the software needs to be a little different to do it self-paced. Um, I love the way it works right now that we're together, that we have a beginning, we have a middle, and we have an end. I don't know, maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but uh, I really think that if we want to become together and be a community, we can't be a community if we're all going in a million different directions at the same time. That's what the web already is. That's not That's not what I like. And so I, I would rather have said, okay, you're interested in our class. You're, you know, we got 6,000. We're halfway through. We'll put you on a wait list. You can watch the lectures, but you can't take the quizzes. I just don't want you to take the quizzes after week four, but you can you can be in a preview mode, and when the class comes, you can take the lectures. you got to come to the beginning of the class. You can't show up halfway through the semester and start advocating for needing full credit because it really disrespects the people 
who worked the whole time. And I'm not going to change that. I don't change that when I teach live classes, and I don't like changing it when I teach here. So, enough on that. Okay, <clears throat> going forward. So, maybe you haven't figured this out by now, but um, I believe that technology is a fundamental skill that all human beings should understand. It is as fundamental as reading and writing. Um, it might not have been that way in 1975, but it is that way today. And I, there's certainly computer science, and there's web design, and all kinds of things, but I really think that everybody, regardless of what they're doing in life, needs a, a, just a basic literacy of technology. And I don't even mean Excel. I mean understanding, the kind of stuff we talked about in this class. So I, this has just been my personal quest like since 2007. And so this class, as I sort of told you at the very beginning, my purpose in this class was to, to raise your curiosity and make you want more and make you realize that no matter what your major was, the technology could be part of your life going forward. That technology wasn't hard. Technology wasn't for the experts. Technology is for everybody and that means everybody. So people are like, okay, great, whatever. What course are you going to teach next? I'm curious now. You've got me. <clears throat> so, so what course will I teach next? Well, um, I'll certainly be teaching Internet History Technology again, but that's probably not what you were most curious about. Um, the University of Michigan now has an approval process for courses. When we got started, it was just, yo, here's, here's some people, let's make some courses. It's a prototype. Now the prototype is done. And so we have processes. And I've applied to, uh, to if they accept it, to uh, teach a course called Python for Informatics that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a bit. And we'll see how that goes. Um, it may take a while. It may be a year from now, maybe next fall, before I'm actually teaching that. I'd like it to be a really awesome class. I'm going to make materials starting immediately, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. So the things that I've been working on, and this is really something I've been working on to, at the University of Michigan School of Information since 2007, is to build what I consider the perfect sequence of classes for people who are not going to be computer scientists. And it starts kind of with this class, which is sort of like the um, history but nerdy view of history to the point where you realize by the end that you can understand what a packet is and it's not so scary and you can look at a net mask and understand IP addresses and network numbers and how routers works and what hop counts are even though at the very beginning all you all we were asking you is what was the flaw of the German enigma again I sneaked you into that right I sneaked you into sort of seeing things from a technical perspective goal of this class curiosity plain and simple curiosity that leads into another class that I call Python for Informatics, Exploring Data. And it's really teaching programming, but not to become a computer scientist or an applied math or a data mining, but just to sort of see how the world fits together and all this stuff. It's more like, say, what the heck is going on inside all these things? How did Dr. Chuck make that map? That actually making the map will be one of the assignments in that class. So how would you read some data from a survey and call a geocoding API? And then how would you map that on Google Maps? That'd be kind of fun. It's not programming kind of in the classic sense of you're going to work at, at, a, at LG and you're going to build some new Samsung smartphone and you've got to figure out. The, no, no, that's really that's hard computer science and you really need to be skilled for that. But kind of hacking around with data, not so much. And then after that, you sort of, the next class is a class that uh, has to do with building dynamic websites with Google App Engine. So it, I don't know when I'll get to teach these courses, but I'm already teaching these courses, and I teach them at the University of Michigan. And you can already watch these courses in action. And so I've written a textbook for the Python for Informatics, Exploring Information. Um, what's lovely is it's free. Open textbook, free textbook. And I've got all my course materials up on this website called pythonlearn.com. There's a iTunes, uh, iBooks version of this. There's a PDF version. I should put up an EPUB. I, I want to do some work before I share it with you completely. But if you're really crazy, feel free to watch. And I update this every time I teach my SI-502 course um, here at the University of Michigan. I also use this material as part of an undergraduate course that I teach, uh, SI-301 as well. And so there's that book. That will be what I want to teach in Coursera next. And I will probably, over the next 12 months, be doing various experiments. We're also doing some experiments with a local high school that's adopting the materials, as well as some uh, a local middle school that's adopting the materials as well. And so that's really exciting. And so that kind of touches the both the 
you know, reach out to everybody with a free book that teaches broadly how technology works, um, as well as help transition from uh, K-12 schools into college. And so, so this is something that really means a lot to me. And, and one way or the other, I will, I will put this forward, and I hope to see it in Coursera. The follow-on class um, is a class that we call SI-539 here at the University of Michigan. Um, and it's about App Engine. And I wrote the O'Reilly book on the App Engine. It's not, an, it's not an open book, but I've talked to O'Reilly about possibly releasing portions of the book as part of a Coursera course, and I'd love to see that happen as well. So I could give you a free e version of, of a partial e, a free e version of part of the book as part of a Coursera course. That'd be kind of cool. But what I love about Google App Engine is that um, you, it's free, and you can host dynamic websites in the Google infrastructure, which means that no matter where you're at and no matter how bad your internet connection is, you can put your application inside Google's infrastructure. For me, it's a very much a dem democratization of access to server technology. And so as soon as I saw this in 2008, I immediately wrote a book about this because it's like, this could change the world, right? You don't have to buy servers. If you live in a third world country, you can still create a rich, environment, you can put ads on it, you can do all these things, and all the while using Google's infrastructure. I think it's really exciting and it's a, a great feature. And it's a great context to learn HTML and CSS and JavaScript and stuff like that. So that's another one of my courses. Now another course that is not on my list of things that I would like to get in Coursera eventually is a more advanced class which follows on those, those, those first three classes I mentioned, a PHP and MySQL class. Now, I bring this class up because it is a follow-on class, but also because um, I'm going to, because of this Coursera experience, I mean, you have to understand that you guys have taught me a lot of stuff. I mean, I shared with you my stuff that I have, and you learned from that, but you also taught me about how to teach. And I'm going to try, for the first time in my career, inverting the classroom. I, everyone talks about how cool it is. I, I, I really look very warily. It's an idea. I don't like hype. Um, but this experience in Coursera has really emboldened me to actually take the risk of inverting the classroom. And I think there are things you can do, particularly teaching software and software development in inverted classroom, and I'm really excited about that. And all my materials that will be not in the classroom part, but the out of the classroom part will all be publicly available, and you can watch that if you so desire. Um, and then if you want to keep track of all this stuff and stick together, uh, the uh, students have formed a Facebook group for Internet History Technology. I think there's uh, about 500 people on it already. And uh, I'll let people know, like when I'm traveling, I'll let people know if I'm teaching courses, just my, if my normal Michigan course materials are available, if people want to play with those. And, uh, and we can see where it goes. Uh, I think that those materials will be destined to be in Coursera, but that doesn't stop us uh, the time it will take to get those in a Corsair doesn't stop us from playing around. So I want to make an offer. We'll see if I'm crazy. I try to. I like to do things before anyone else does them and invent a new idea. So here's an idea that I actually got from a fellow named David Wiley in 2007 when he was at Utah State University, and that is real signed certificates. So you're going to get a certificate. If you pass the course from Coursera, you'll get an email, you'll download a PDF, and it's awesome. It'll have a real, it'll have a digital signature for me. What I will do is if you take that and you print it out and you put it in an envelope, and I will send you the, e the physical address via class email. If you send it to me and with a self-addressed stamped envelope, because I'm not going to figure out all the international postage. You have to help me and figure out that international postage. If you include a self-addressed stamped envelope, I will sign your certificate and I will put it back in an envelope and I will send it back to you. So as many as I get, I've warned them that there are 5,000 people that might be sending up to the dean's office, so we'll see. Um, but if you want to send it in, I will sign it and send it back. It might take me a while. They might stack up. Um, and so, so with that... I want to say thank you. I want to thank you for sharing your time with me uh, from July 23rd until today. It's, it's been an honor to be in a learning community with you. It has been an honor learning from you. Uh, I, I have gained so much from this experience, uh, particularly because technology is my curiosity, teaching technology is my curiosity, teaching with technology is my curiosity, 
and I could have had no better group of people, no better uh, environment than Coursera has provided, and, and no better Coursera staff support, no better support from the University of Michigan. I was like a kid in a candy store with all of you. I really believe in the Teach the World that Daphne is trying to do. I, I hope that this class was an example of this. And um, I just, I was honored to have my classes uh, translated in so many languages. And, and I just, I sort of want to close with this uh, little thing from a person in the class. By the way, this uh, person got a 89 out of 100, got a certificate. Did one of the, not an English speaker, um, you can see he's writing in, in Google Translate. And, and this kind of sort of sums up what I was striving to achieve in the class, and that is make a class that had enough rich content that could make it through a language barrier and back. Right? So this is a person that did his writing in Google Translate, did his grading in Google Translate, and then sent me a thank you note in Google Translate. And it's a small thing, but it is kind of why I think we're doing all this, is to have those small things happen around the world. So again, I thank you, and we'll see you next time.